people, when they hear about global warming, they have this uh, doom and gloom mentality that it's going to just be a disaster and, and wipe out all life on Earth. And really, we, we need to consider that actually global warming may have a number of positive benefits uh, as well. And now, cer now certainly it'll have some negative consequences, but we need to consider the fact that, for example, human lives will probably be saved as a result of global warming because, after all, more people die of exposure to cold than they do exposure to heat and therefore increasing Earth's temperatures will likely result in fewer uh, human casualties. Now that's something that people need to consider, as well as certain areas of the world becoming more habitable as a result of uh, global warming. And, I, and granted, certain areas becoming less habitable as well. So things are going to change, but uh, not all of it's negative change, and therefore we ought to have a uh, balanced uh, view of global warming and not just to have a reactionary position on it. You know, in science, as Lord Kelvin said, um, all science is numbers. And so when I hear people talk about polar bears, I say, well, let's be scientific about them. Let's count the polar bears. And it turns out the polar bear population has grown by a factor of over three in the last 40 years. Some experts say the record-setting 2005 hurricane season is evidence for global warming, but not all agree. There's a lot of uncertainty about whether hurricanes are either more frequent or more intense. Certainly, 2005 was a record year for hurricane hits in the United States. That was pretty amazing. But then you remember 2006 was a flop, basically. It was below normal. And it turns out that since we only have good hurricane data as far as how many hurricanes are out there in the Atlantic, since we've had weather satellites back in the 1970s, that we really don't know how many there were before then with much confidence. In the period from about 1970 to about 1995, there was a period of low hurricane frequency, and we kind of got lulled into the period, uh, lulled into the idea there wasn't going to be very many hurricanes. Suddenly in the late 1990s and the early 2000s, we got a lot more hurricanes and they were more intense. Much of the damage, however, that was produced by these wasn't due to more hurricanes and more intense ones. It had to do more with the fact that we had more structures built along coastlines. There was more buildings and more families and more casinos. And when a hurricane hits one of those, it's going to do a lot of damage. But what about the future? News reports claim global warming is the number one threat to our future survival as a planet, saying that ice caps could melt, submerging entire cities under the ocean. For example, on, on sea level rise, you know, people have, particularly because of Al Gore's movie An Inconvenient Truth, they have these pictures in mind of, of sea level rising 20, 40, 60 feet, something like that. Well, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change estimates uh, sea level rise through the entire 21st century at probably not more than a total of 16 inches in the entire century. Whether the oceans are going to rise two and a half feet over the next hundred years, or whether they're going to rise 20 feet, which is the model that Al Gore uses for his Inconvenient Truth, his crocumentary uh, that won an Oscar. Um, I mean, it, it is a doomsday um, scenario that there's absolutely no scientific evidence for. Uh, no reputable scientist is talking about a 20-foot increase in the oceans. The amount of sea level rise has, has, has been downgraded over, over time. Uh, in the 1980s, they were talking about six feet of rise by 2100. Then it went down to two feet. In the latest 2007, IPCC report only said about one foot to maybe 16 inches. And it's interesting that that, that estimated dr uh, uh, drop in sea level caused a lot of environmentalists to, to uh, complain to the IPCC to, to not do that, not de-emphasize uh, the sea level rise. Some experts say we should take aggressive action to reduce consumption of fossil fuels, not only to protect the environment itself, but also to save people living in poverty. Others say the opposite is true. We have at least one million Africans dying each year because of a lack of access to electricity. We have Africans dying by the hundreds of thousands, mostly children, because we've got poor people burning wood and dung in huts, which cause respiratory illnesses, which kill mostly children. 
Meanwhile, these people can't have electricity because environmentalists that don't even live in Africa put pressure on their governments and don't let them build hydroelectric dams that could give them electricity and save their lives. So basically, what's happening is we are sacrificing the poor at the altar of radical environmentalism. Even if scientists don't have all the answers, Christians should be concerned about global warming, but they should also be concerned about their approach to the issue. I think there's some very significant risks to uh, evangelicals getting involved with this without really knowing the science or the economics well. The first and most important risk, the one that I care about the most, is that they might unwittingly endorse a policy that is very destructive to the poorest people in this world, the most vulnerable people. Those people desperately need abundant and cheap energy to drive the economic development that will lift them out of absolute poverty. In Genesis chapter 2, uh, Adam was put into the garden to keep it and to till it. To keep it means to guard it and to protect it. To till it means to cause it to bring forth its fruit, to develop it, for what purpose? For human good. From a biblical standpoint, I think we are called to be good stewards of the environment, right? And that's where Christians, you know, understandably get involved in environmentalism. Uh, of course, what does good stewardship mean? I mean, I, it's clear that humans come first, but at the same time, we shouldn't be destroying the environment wantonly. So there is a gray area and people have to decide, you know, how far you go to protect the environment. I think we need to, uh, in, our, in our evangelical Christian churches, do a far better job than we have of helping people to understand what a biblical earth keeping ethic is what creation care really means and what our responsibilities are in terms of creation care. But, and, and part of that being to understand that human beings come first in God's creation, not last, and are not irrelevant, and are not considered the enemies of God's creation. The amount of global warming so far since 1880, the end of the Little Ice Age, is only 1.2 degrees Fahrenheit. 1.2 degrees Fahrenheit, that is not a lot to panic over. And I, and I believe a good proportion of that can be, is from natural processes, and it can be demonstrated from the literature. CO2 is presented as a pollutant because you want to show that it's the byproduct of industry, which is what they're attacking. In fact, uh, there is no life on Earth without CO2 in the atmosphere. Plants uh, need it to produce oxygen, and without that oxygen, there, there is no living things on the planet. And to uh, push to lower CO2 levels is, in fact, endangering the uh, planet and life on it much more than any increase in CO2. There is one major benefit, I think, to uh, the increase in carbon dioxide that everybody's concerned about, and that is plants grow much more effectively they will grow, uh, you can increase the carbon dioxide in greenhouses and you'll get grant, uh, plants to grow at a rate of two and three times what they normally do and they take much less water in order to be able to grow. In the documentary titled The Great Global Warming Swindle, scientists question today's popular theory on global warming. Dr. Tim Ball, a prominent climatologist from Canada, has received several death threats for speaking out on his views regarding the causes of climate change. All scientists should be skeptics. All scientists should question um, anything and challenge all the time. Where it became really personal and nasty was when we were, we were called deniers. Um, and of course, all of the Holocaust uh, connotations of that term, uh, which is really an obscenity, What's amusing about it is um, we're called climate change deniers when in fact my whole career has been going around the country saying the climate changes all the time. Just by saying that I don't think that humans control climate, I am uh, painted into a corner and, uh, and, and somehow cast as a, as a demon by one side and as a hero by the other. And I think I'm not really a hero nor a demon, but I'm just a scientist who 
studies what, it, what he sees and, uh, and tries to report on it. The radical environmentalist movement, one of the key problems that they have is in order to make some of the statements they're saying, they have to basically ignore science. And if you're trying to take care of the earth, if you're trying to make sure Earth's ecosystems are working correctly and so forth, then in the end you have to look at science. It's our only tool for knowing uh, what's wrong with the earth, how to fix it and so forth. Time and time again though, these radical environmentalists